Hello, my name is Matthew Mack. I am a first year DFU student. Um, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist slash developmental psychologist in training. Um, currently, I split my time between the Department of Experimental Psychology and the Functional MRI Center here in JL Hospital. Um, my research interest revolved around the neural mechanism underlying language learning and language disabilities. But today, I'll be telling you about memory formation in the brain. Um, the reason being that this forms the backbone of my entire research project. Um, this talk is very general um, because I, I, it's going to take me take like 20 minutes for me to explain my entire research project. So this is a very general talk. And if you're doing neuroscience, psychiatry, psychology, you probably know a lot of things in this presentation. So let's start off with some basic neuroanatomical structures that I need you to be familiar with for the purpose of this talk. Because if you don't understand them, um, it would be very hard for me to explain what's going on. So here is the human brain, uh, which can be broadly divided into three components. The reptilian brain, the midbrain, and the neocortex. The reptilian brain is definitely the most important part of your entire human brain because it is responsible for regulating heartbeat, breathing, your movement. If you have damages, serious damages in this particular area of the brain, your life will be very miserable or you will die right away. And then the midbrain is this area, the yellow part. Um, this is where sensory information is initially processed and it's also where new memories is initially formed. And then in the neocortex, it is where your language, your creativity, your thinking are located. But most importantly, I need you to remember for the time being that neocortex is where long-term memories are stored. And then the next uh, structure that I would like you to remember is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is located in the midbrain and it is responsible for learning new information. For example, if I tell you to remember one plus one equals to six, you will have absolutely no problem learning that because of the hippocampus. Uh, if I surgically remove this area from your brain, you will have extreme difficulty remembering one plus one equals to six. Um, and for patients with Alzheimer's disease, they, um, it is always this particular area that is first affected. So that's why people with Alzheimer's have problems learning new materials, but they don't have problems recalling old information because as I've mentioned in the previous slide, long-term memories are stored primarily in the neocortex. And then if you're a, a quick learner or quick thinker, you probably should be able to connect the dots by now that what I'm presenting to you is a kind of division of labor. Um, so initially memories are formed in the hippocampus and then somehow the hippocampus has to send information and memories into the neocortex. And this is what neuroscientists call cortical or system consolidation and this is exactly what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how to artificially um, enhance this communicative process between the hippocampus and the neocortex. And I guess right now some of you may be wondering why we need the hippocampus and the neocortex for memory formation and memory processing. Why shouldn't we just have like one brain structure for processing and storage? Wouldn't that make lives a bit easier? Um, so the simple reason is that the neocortex and the hippocampus each has its own strengths and weaknesses. So let's talk about the neocortex first. Um, the neocortex, the storage capacity in the neocortex, which is this entire orange area, is potentially infinite. There is definitely no upper limit on how much information can be stored in the neocortex. And then another advantage of the neocortex is that memories are distributed across the entire neocortex, meaning that if there's damages in the frontal part of your brain, the memories in the posterior part of your brain will be relatively intact, so your life wouldn't be that miserable, you will still have some memories left in your brain. But if memories are stored in only one area, such as the hippocampus, and if there were a stroke happening, happened in the hippocampus, you will lose basically all your memories. So that's why we need memories to be stored in the neocortex. So in a sense, it resembles putting all your eggs in different baskets. And then um, another advantage of the neocortex, which I didn't write in the slide, is that the memories stored in the neocortex are very stable. It is very resistant to forgetting. So that's why you want memories to be stored in the neocortex. 
But in contrast, the hippocampus, uh, oh no, I forgot to talk about the disadvantage. Um, the disadvantage of the neocortex is that it is a very slow learner. It takes lots of time for the neocortex to learn something new. And what neuroscientists in general refer to learning is the establishment of new links between neurons. So if you want to learn something new, you need this neuron and that neuron to create a, a new links to form between them. Um, the neurons in the neocortex are relatively inflexible. It takes months or years to form this kind of connections. But in contrast, the hippocampus is extremely fast. It is a very fast learner. Um, for example, if I just mentioned, if, you, if I asked you to remember one plus one equals to six, you wouldn't have any problems remembering that because the neurons in the hippocampus are relatively more flexible in terms of learning new information. But the problem with the hippocampus is that it is space limited. You can't store too much information in the brain. So that is why we need the neocortex and the uh, hippocampus to form memories. And this is what uh, neuroscientists refer to complementary learning system. In a sense, they complement each other. Uh, so for the hippocampus, it forms new memories, and then for the neocortex, it's a long-term storage. And then, the big question is, how does the hippocampus send information to the neocortex? As I mentioned, it is beneficial for memories to be stored in the neocortex. So you want memories from the hippocampus to migrate to the neocortex. So neuroscientists and a lot of psychiatrists have spent years finding, uh, trying to find out how the hippocampus sends information to the neocortex. So basically, the hippocampus has two states, an encoding state and a consolidation state. When there is sensory input, so right now, uh, you are hearing a lot of uh, new information. So your brain, your hippocampus is trying to learn something from my speech. So whenever there is sensory input, the hippocampus will be uh, trying to encode information. And when there is a stop of sensory input, the brain, the hippocampus will start to send information into the neocortex. So when, so I guess some of you may be able to guess that when we will have less sensory input, and that is during sleep. Um, when we sleep, we give um, the hippocampus a very good time window to send information into the neocortex. And so that's why you need to sleep. A key message of this um, presentation is that you need to sleep in order to remember. If you don't sleep, your memories will stay in the hippocampus, and then it's very likely that your hippocampus will lose those information. And sleep is, give, will give the hippocampus a great chance to send information into the neocortex. But the problem with sleep is that there are a lot of stages in sleep. So um, sometimes you will be in light sleep, sometimes you will be in, in REM sleep. So there are different stages of sleep um, when, you, when you sleep. And neuroscientists have been trying to figure out where, when does the communication between the hippocampus and the neocortex takes place. And a lot of evidence shows that it is during deep sleep. Um, I won't be discussing what exactly deep sleep is because it's gonna take like, maybe like 20 minutes. But basically, it is during deep sleep that memory can be transferred from the hippocampus to the neocortex. And there's one very interesting study showing this kind of communication between the hippocampus and the neocortex during deep sleep. So this group, this paper was published in Science and is one of the uh, highly cited paper in the field. So at uh, the beginning, the participants learned some lo location of some specific objects while some smell was presented. And then the participants sleep while their brain waves were monitored by the researchers. And then there were two groups. Uh, when the participants enter deep sleep, the researchers re-expose the participants to the smell. And then for another group, the researchers expose the participants to the smell when they enter REM sleep. And interestingly, the results show that only for participants who got re-exposed to, uh, re to the smell during deep sleep can recall what they have learned in the previous day. So this study showed that um, if you want to remember something, it is very important for you to enter deep sleep. And interestingly, the older you get, the less deep sleep you will have. So uh, that's why you need to sleep, because you will have less deep sleep uh, the older you get. 
<laughs> and then, oops, time's up. Um, so to sum up, sleep is very important for memory. And there's also one very interest, uh, lot of interesting, okay. Uh, there are some interesting studies showing that if you learn something before, right before you sleep, it is much more likely that you are going to remember it because the brain will, the hippocampus will soon enter into, um, will enter consolidation state because, uh, so that gives a better chance for those new memories to be transferred into the new cortex. So um, this is basically what I want to talk about in this presentation. Since I still have time left, uh, I will talk a little bit about, I, I still have time left, right? Okay, so let's go, go through this very quickly. Um, so when you drink wine, wine is a very interesting um, is a very interesting thing. It can help you help your hippocampus to enter consolidation state. So for example, if you drink wine at 10 p.m., um, the hippocampus will also enter consolidation state very soon after you started drinking. So in other words, you will very likely to remember what you have learned before you drinking wine, but you will not be able to remember what happened you started drinking wine. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is uh, some very interesting results that um, um, the, the literature has shown. And this is the end of my presentation. If you have any <laughs> questions. <laughs>